Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, so thanks everybody for coming out today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Sunlin, um, which is maybe one of the uh, open stack components that you haven't heard very much about yet. Um, and we'll hopefully solve that problem for you today and show you uh, what's going on with Sunlin. Uh, so my name is Mark Velker. I'm the open stack architect at VMware. Uh, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Uh, I'm uh, Chi Ming Tang. I'm from IBM, a researcher working on the sending project. Hello, everyone. This is Xinhui from VMware. I'm a developer engineer and working with Mark Tageller and Qi Ming. Right. So without further ado. Um, so just to give you a feel for what we're going to talk about today, we're going to start off uh, talking a little bit about requirements for resource uh, pool management. Uh, then we'll talk about Senlin in particular. Uh, and then we'll actually do a little demo for you uh, a little bit later on. Uh, so let's talk about managing resource pools. Um, when we think about clustering in OpenStack today, there's actually several services in OpenStack that do some sort of clustering in some form or another. Um, and uh, one of the things we'll see about Sunlin is that uh, it, it's kind of uh, correlating a lot of that work and, and kind of putting things together. Um, when you think about um, cluster management, there's a few things that come to mind. One is simple manageability. You got to understand which um, bits of your infrastructure are part of which clusters, right? Um, so very simply, cluster membership. Um, you think about elasticity. Um, so in any, in any cloud native environment, uh, in any cloud native application uh, that people are, are writing Greenfield these days, um, one of the things that you have uh, going in your favor in the cloud is an expandable model uh, to where you can bring up new infrastructure on demand um, very quickly uh, and add that to your, to your cluster. Um, load balancing, um, very, very common pattern in applications today is that we have several uh, maybe stateless services sitting behind a load balancer somewhere. Uh, maybe actively distributing work among them, uh, or maybe in other cases it's an active failover scenario. Uh, but the more uh, more cloud native applications these days are moving to a model where, uh, for the stateless pieces of the infrastructure, uh, they're more horizontally expandable. Right. Um, so load balancing is a, is an important part of uh, the general requirements. Um, we look at flexibility. Um, when we look at the kinds of applications that are out there today, there's a lot of different patterns. Um, and a lot of different ways that they may want to deal with clustering. Uh, so we talked just a second ago about active-active versus active-passive, right? Uh, there's maybe a lot of other patterns that you might look at there as well, especially when you look at changing uh, the dynamics of a cluster in response to uh, changing conditions in the environment. Um, maybe when a lot of new load gets thrown at your application uh, because it's an e-commerce platform running Black Friday sales, um, maybe you need to expand horizontally to a lot more nodes. In other cases, maybe the more economical thing for you to do is not to expand the number of nodes, but to change the size of those nodes, or maybe move them to a different I.O. zone so they have better I.O. Uh, or there's you know, other dynamics that can come into play there. Um, and if you're really optimizing an application, um, those things actually wind up uh, turning into dollar signs at some point as well, in many cases. Um, so when I spin up lots of new instances, uh, that's relatively expensive maybe compared to uh, moving them to a different zone, for example. Um, so we want some flexibility. Um, we also think about flexibility as well uh, in terms of the things that determine the dynamics of the cluster. Um, so um, maybe the best indicator of when I need to change the, the cluster, maybe expand it out horizontally, maybe the best indicator for me is not necessarily how, how pegged the CPUs are. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something inside the application itself that's the trigger to expand or contract that cluster. And those use cases can be very different between different applications as well. So that's something we want to think about as well, is having a lot of flexibility in, in an engine for cluster management. Uh, and last, we want to think about extensibility. Um, we all know that there's lots of uh, types of different resources that we deal with in OpenStack today. We also know that that set is ever expanding. Um, with, especially with the Big Ten, there's all kinds of new projects coming into play, all kinds of new dynamics that we're seeing out there. Um, up on the keynote stages this morning, we talked a little bit about some of the clustering, uh, or sorry, some of the container uh, bits that are out there now that are really becoming very prevalent in, a, in an open stacks world. Um, so we need something that's going to be extensible as well. So let's think a little bit about what we have today uh, in terms of cluster management in OpenStack. Primarily, the way that people think about that today in OpenStack is with Heat. Um, heat has um, Heat is essentially an orchestration service. Uh, and inherent in that, it has an auto-scaling policy. So we do have some auto-scaling and cluster management capabilities in Heat today. Um, when we look at what that looks like, uh, if you're familiar with Heat at all, it's basically an auto-scaling group that you create in your Heat templates, uh, scaling policy and alarm uh, to trigger uh, when, when things happen in terms of um, auto-scaling actions. Um, the Heat auto-scaling model was uh, kind of taken from the AWS model. Um, actually doesn't have the full capabilities that AWS has today. So it's a fairly limited use case. 
Um, and at the end of the day, that has uh, proven to be sort of a minimally viable product that suits a whole lot of use cases that are out there today. So, you know, it's a great start. Um, and when we look at the things that um, it can talk to today and what it can do to OpenStack today, uh, it's sort of, sort of a good minimal uh, set for auto-scaling. However, uh, at the end of the day, Heat's mission really isn't to care about auto-scaling necessarily. It's, it's a piece of the puzzle. But what Heat really wants to do is orchestrate things. And auto-scaling just sort of happens to be a component of that. When we look out across the rest of OpenStack, there are other uh, components that are kind of in a similar situation where um, they need some sort, of, some, some sort of manageability, but it's not kind of core to their mission necessarily. So when we started looking out at, at sort of the uh, OpenStack ecosystem, um, one of the things that became apparent was maybe we need to think a little bit about cluster management as sort of a first class service that everything else can tie into. Um, and so the, the uh, Sunland folks here have, have been doing a lot of talking with the Heat folks uh, and looking at maybe taking um, the auto scaling capabilities that are in Heat today and offloading those to a new service in the future that can expand the set of capabilities that are offered there um, without putting too much load on, on the Heat folks themselves. Okay. Um, that also opens a lot of interesting doors for us um, because if we make uh, auto scaling and, and cluster management sort of first class things in their own component, um, with, its, with uh, that being their core mission, there's a lot of room to expand what we offer. So maybe we go outside of the set of things that we have in heat uh, auto scaling today. Uh, maybe we go to a super set of what's available in AWS today uh, because we are in many cases uh, deploying OpenStack in private cloud environments where there are very opinionated choices made about the underpinning infrastructure uh, that may have different capabilities that we may be able to expose uh, that may actually be advantageous for folks there. Okay, so lots to think about here. Um, in the course of, of kind of doing all this, um, listening to the, the sort of end user community always comes into play as well. Uh, and so as, as we've all talked to, to customers that we're seeing out in the field and people that are pulling up stock today, uh, some requirements have sort of come up that we thought we'd talk through uh, about what they would really like to see uh, in terms of uh, cluster management and auto scaling in the future. Um, so first one is uh, cross availability zone placement. Um, you can kind of obviously see how applications that are living in a cloud native world want to uh, span across different failure domains and be managed still by sort of a central service that knows about their health, right? Uh, and very similarly, we may actually have cross region placement needs as well. Uh, where applications that we're running in OpenStack clouds may need to run, say, on more than one continent, uh, or maybe on other sides of the country, uh, or maybe, again, just for um, uh, sort of uh, resiliency of the application, you want to put them in, in different geographies uh, so that an earthquake doesn't uh, totally take down your, your application, for example. Um, Anti-affinity placement, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, should, be, should be pretty familiar for most folks. Um, Choosing a specific node to delete when scaling in. So a lot of times when we talk about auto scaling, we think only about the expanding use case where demand goes up. Uh, equally important, especially when you attach the dollar signs, is scaling back down when the demand goes, goes away. Um, and in some cases, there are applications out there that want to make very opinionated choices about which nodes they kill. And if you think about that in the context of being very aware of the underpinning infrastructure in some of these cases, um, it makes a lot of sense because maybe when I scaled up my application, one of the things that I did is that those new nodes that I brought online, I put them in, say, a more expensive I.O. region because I.O. was my bottleneck. Or maybe I put them on better hardware or a more expensive region uh, or more expensive availability zone. So maybe it's those nodes that I want to get rid of first, right, when I scale back down. Because I don't need that extra capacity and I don't, certainly don't want to pay for it anymore. Um, triggering auto-scaling with application level metrics. Um, a lot of the auto-scaling that happens today, both in OpenStack and in other applications, looks at infrastructure level metrics. So we're looking at CPU on the nodes that are running, um, RAM utilization, IO, uh, IOPS on the, the actual nodes that are running there. But in some cases, it's the application that actually needs to trigger whether it's healthy or not. And there may be very specific uh, app level things in there. So this kind of goes back to that concept of flexibility. If we're gonna talk about application level metrics, um, then we need a pretty generic processing engine to be able to do that. Um, manual scaling, we talk about auto scaling, uh, but we also talk about manual scaling because even though the application is healthy, I can see that maybe somewhere down the line next week, I'm gonna start a big sale on my e-commerce site and I wanna scale out to be ready for that ahead of time, right? Um, so the ability to do manual scaling. Um, automatic node recovery. Um, so we've talked about sort of expanding nodes up and down within a cluster. Uh, what we may also want to have is some level of health monitoring within that cluster 
to know when a node goes healthy uh, from a healthy state to an unhealthy state, uh, maybe even goes away completely, and then we automatically bring it back online. And uh, again, something that you saw a little bit of kind of this morning uh, on the, the keynote stage. Um, migrating nodes from a standby cluster for rapid provisioning. Uh, so when we think about um, how, how quickly we are able to respond to auto-scaling events in the real world, um, we all know that it takes a little while for a server to come online. Uh, even if you're uh, maybe even using containers, um, those still take a little bit of time to come online. Um, so one of the sort of traditional ways that application developers have dealt with that in the past is to keep a warm pool. So you have a warm pool of resources uh, that you can immediately transfer into an active cluster uh, to bring up more capacity very, very quickly and then backfill your pool. Um, in fact, if you look at the OpenStack Infra team, we actually do this um, in the real world for managing OpenStack CI today uh, with NodePool. Um, and also uh, soft scaling as well. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks, Mark, for, for the uh, quick in introduction. So next, I will give you all a quick overview of the sending project. Uh, actually, uh, we, uh, we didn't start everything from scratch. Um, the whole idea was um, offloaded from, from Heat. Uh, before we started th this project, we had uh, several rounds of discussion with the Heat core team, whether this is the right thing to do, whether we should do auto-scaling again inside heat or just start a new service. So uh, after several rounds of discussion, we decided maybe uh, starting a new project is the right thing to do. Uh, that will give us a quick uh, uh, deliver. So if we uh, do everything inside heat, we, we, yes, we get some strict code review and uh, it may take forever for the whole thing to land. But if we start something new, um, maybe, actually, we only uh, use one year to get the whole thing uh, built up, and now Selenium is an official project in OpenStack. So um, when we started this uh, project, uh, uh, it's a new project, so we actually need to build everything, uh, every single line of code by ourselves. Sometimes we steal, sometimes we borrow, <laughs> uh, if the license uh, permit. So uh, the first thing uh, uh, we, we thought is uh, what we need to do as a first step. So uh, we have to attack the, the, the problem in a step-by-step -step way. The first thing is we need some kind of a group management. You create individual nodes, you group things together, you, mem you can manage the membership of those groups manually. That's the first step. Then you can uh, provide some primitives so that you can scale that group manually easily. Then you can try to introduce some intelligence into the service, make the scaling operation a little bit smarter, a little bit automatic. So that's the uh, philosophy we have. So um, speaking of uh, uh, resource pool management, we try to look around uh, OpenStack and see if there is anything we can leverage. But uh, sadly, no, we don't have any existing um, grouping service or clustering service there. So, okay, we found this is a missing piece in OpenStack. So why don't we just build a clustering service? With that uh, clustering service, we can make auto-scaling uh, with the re redundancy provided uh, by a resource pool, we can also provision high availability. So you know, all high availability solutions based on resource pool, based on resource res redundancy. That's a natural fit. So uh, we can make the um, uh, resource pool load balanced. But sometimes um, uh, all these advanced features are not so, uh, you may need uh, one or two of the features. You may not need them all. Uh, you may need just one auto-scaled uh, cluster, but you, you you don't want to do load balance. You you have a load balance cluster, but you, you you don't want that cluster to be auto auto-scaled. 
So all these features are orthogonal. They are independent from each other. And uh, so uh, in such kind of a service, the auto scaling and auto heating features are all usage scenarios. So the basic is still a clustering service. Uh, speaking of the objects we can manage, it can be anything. It can be a Nova server. It can be a heat stack, for example. It can be a signal volume, whatever. Flo floating IP pools, for example. Uh, we don't care. So we want to build just a foundational service allowing you to manage resource pools. That's the whole idea. So uh, this, is, this picture is showing us the high-level architecture of the sending uh, project. We have sending a client talking to the sending API uh, in, in a restful way. And then the sending API talks to the backend sending engine uh, via RPC. Actually, you can deploy more than one sending engine so that the scalability won't be a, a bottleneck. Um, uh, uh, the, the engine is uh, architected to uh, to be able to manage different kind of uh, resource types. Uh, we use a new abstraction called Profile. A Profile basically is the driver that allows you to tell sending engine how to create, how to delete, how to update an object. That object can, could be anything that I just mentioned. Uh, to uh, make the engine a little bit smarter, we also um, uh, invented a Policy policy has been abused in many ways, so we are abusing it again. So a policy can be uh, anything you want to enforce, any set of rules you want to enforce to be checked when you are performing some operations on a cluster. So that's the whole idea. Um, so this th this page is showing some examples of the profiles and the policies we are, we are providing. Um, eventually, we we hope sending can help you manage uh, clusters of physical machines, virtual machines, and heat stacks, and even containers. So that's that's a, a very ambitious goal. Um, you can do all these things uh, via profile or plugins. Um, speaking of policies, today uh, in our version 1.0 release, we already have placement policy that allows you allowing you to uh, specify cross region, cross uh, uh, availability zone placement, and deletion policy allowing you to specify uh, the criteria you want to uh, enforce when removing some nodes from a cluster, and scaling policy, which is very similar to the heat uh, implementation and the Amazon uh, uh, specification. Uh, we also have some preliminary support uh, uh, to uh, cluster health today, uh, but uh, it is uh, still under development. Uh, hopefully, uh, by the end of the Newton cycle, we can come up with a whole story how to maintain the health of a cluster. And load balance, uh, we support LBA. Uh, AAS V2 uh, uh, from the very beginning. We we we, we don't have uh, support to LB AAS V1. Um, batching policy is uh, something we need to figure out uh, because when you are deploying a large cluster, uh, it may involve uh, a, a lot of invocations to the backend service. For example, you are creating a cluster of 1,000 Nova servers. You don't want to. Um, send out 1,000 uh, VM create requests to Nova API, and that's the DOS attack. So sometimes uh, those kind of things we have to control. Um, okay, I'm going to make this a little bit quicker. Okay, uh, this uh, diagram is a little bit complicated. But uh, this uh, is showing us the whole um, architecture design of the sending server. Uh, the green boxes are, uh, include the sending API and the sending engine. Um, that's the core uh, components of the sending server. All the other components are modeled as plugins. So uh, when you uh, want to extend sending engine to, ma uh, to manage, to create and manage, resource pools of different types, you can simply just uh, uh, 
uh, write our own profile implementation. Today we have some built-in profile for Nova Server and Heat Stack. Uh, since we uh, support Heat Stack, basically we can support any resource type today. Heat already supported. We don't want to reinvent the the wheel. Um, we got some requirements to to manage web application clusters. Um, that's doable, but uh, it's not yet on our agenda, for example. Uh, when the sending engine is talking back to OpenStack, we have the uh, dependency on OpenStack SDK. That is the, the, the only dependency we have on OpenStack. We don't have uh, dependencies on Nova client, Heat client, Cinder client, Yongsun client. We don't have that. That the OpenStack SDK is the single dependency we have uh, today. Uh, if you remove that dependency, you can replace it with a dummy driver. So, in a fake, uh, if you are using fake driver, you can test the whole service very quickly. So uh, that's uh, another advan advantage you get uh, using a driver model. Uh, the upper left uh, corner so a box named the receiver. That's uh, how you uh, trigger uh, sending cluster operations using e uh, external event system or alarm or whatever monitor service you, you prefer. It can be a kilometer alarm, it can be a monasca, it can be not OpenStack uh, a solution, it can be a Nagios, Jabbix, whatever. Uh, the, the only thing uh, you need to expose uh, is just a webhook URL today. And from your monitor service, you can trigger whatever oper operations on a cluster. Um, that's the uh, design. So um, uh, this page is showing us the operations we already support for the different uh, object uh, resources. For clusters, you can create uh, delete update. You can uh, add nodes, uh, delete nodes. You can scale out, scale in and resize and attach policy, detach policy. When a policy is already detached, you can dynamically enable it and disable it. So these uh, are all the flexibilities we provide. Um, so uh, the following uh, slides are showing you a quick look and feel how what are the operations uh, you can do using the sending command line. We already imp uh, implemented the OpenStack client uh, plugin. Uh, so all these commands, uh, even it reads sending, profile, create, um, you can also use OpenStack cluster profile create. So that's uh, that's uh, another alternative because across the community there's a movement to deprecate all the client uh, uh, command line interface. So uh, we are following that direction. You can operate profiles, clusters, nodes, and the cluster uh, membership. Uh, you can manage uh, your policies as just as um, uh, objects. You can manage the cluster and policy uh, association uh, uh, relationships. Uh, you can also um, do some useful things using the command line. For example, uh, I forgot to uh, paste a, 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 a screenshot here. Actually, we have a sending dashboard project uh, launched uh, last year. It's a Horizon plugin. Most of the operations uh, today, we, uh, we provide a command line interface. We also have a web interface uh, uh, API uh, interface for you to use the service. So uh, uh, this page is showing us um, uh, one of the uh, the commands uh, we support is the cluster resize. Uh, you can see here we are trying to make uh, such a command very flexible, very powerful. You can resize your clusters in many ways uh, by percentage, to, or you can specify the new exact capacity of your cluster. And uh, if um, uh, there are size constraints uh, you want to respect when you are resizing your cluster. You can uh, tell sending you want to do a strict uh, resize operation or a best effort uh, operation. 
um, sometimes, uh, as Mark just mentioned, if you want to manually uh, recite or scale out your cluster before the before weekend, so um, you may want to raise the minimum size constraint of your cluster at the same time. Or else, if you have auto scaling uh, policies uh, in place, the cluster size will drop down quickly. So that's something we are, we are trying to provide uh, with these commands. So with that, uh, I'm turning over to um, my friend Xinhui to give us a quick demo how we achieve auto scaling plus high availability plus load balance in a very simple way. Uh, which you can deploy virtually in five minutes or so. Okay, thank you, Qiming. <laughs> okay, here in the rest of time, I will show a, a simple uh, demo about or an example how to use Zenlin to create a, a cluster that's elastic, resilient, and load balanced. And why we choose this example to show? Because we want to try to provide some you know, real reference for the industry practice. So, uh, you know, nowadays actually all the available, uh, you know, auto scaling samples are based on the infrastructure level metrics. That's very simple, such as the CPU utilization or something like that. But actually, in real practice, we will not do that uh, that way because we want to use some business representative metrics to trigger the auto scaling. So that's uh, one trigger reason we choose this example to show. And another reason uh, is we want to highlight is, uh, uh, you know, the auto healing functions actually is very important to auto healing too, auto scaling too. Because if uh, the manager of the auto scaling cannot know how many active nodes actually exactly exist in the pool, that means maybe the auto scaling is totally wrong or, you know, that's not trustable. So we will provide the auto scaling functions also. So. Mm, uh, as Qiming mentioned, actually, uh, all the heat resources has been merged into the heat in Mitaka. So we will show this uh, example in a sing uh, single uh, flight uh, heat template to implement, uh, implement all the functions I just mentioned. And uh, here you can see the architecture of my uh, uh, our uh, demonstration. Uh, here we will use a profile to define the node or uh, parameters configurations we need to create a cluster. And then uh, underlying actually Sunlin we will call Nova driver to create the compute instance uh, based on the profile. And uh, we can attach a policy such as load balancing policy and uh, scaling and uh, health management policy together with the cluster. Once attached a load balancer policy, actually the uh, Selenium will in the backend uh, uh, to create automatically uh, the load balancer, uh, load balance pool, and the uh, health monitor things. And uh, uh, with the attachment of scaling policy, actually we need to create two receivers to receive the scale out and the scale in alarms and uh, uh, to execute accordingly. And for the scale out and the scale in alarms, actually we based on the business metrics that comes from the load balancer uh, throughput. That's a, a representative a transaction based, you know, the metrics we use that to trigger the auto scaling. And for the health management part, actually we will show how to recover, you know, the field node and det uh, uh, detect the, the field node and recover them uh, automatically. There are two ways actually. First one is uh, we use polling. That means use uh, underlying health manager daemon to detect uh, or poll the, all the members and uh, do the uh, recover automatically. The other way is as I showed, uh, you know, here just an example. Uh, we can create a receiver to re to receive the recovery alarm. Actually, the alarm can be triggered from the, you know, the status changed from the load balancer pool, uh, load balancer uh, members that should be changed by, you know, health monitor. So that's um, uh, the architecture. 
And in the uh, followed charts, uh, slides, I will uh, introduce you some, you know, go through some resources together uh, to see how to use this uh, single flight heat template to get the cluster. Uh, this one should be the profile, and uh, here you can see we define all the flavors and uh, uh, all the properties we need to create the node of the Selene. That includes the flavor image and uh, you know network security group, such kind of things. And uh, our cluster results will refer to all these def uh, definitions. And here we need to define the minimum size. That's uh, at least how many nodes you want, and uh, you know, what kind of profile you want to create uh, the cluster. And the next slide is about the load balancer policy. Here you can see, you can uh, define the load balancer pool and the VIP and the health monitor, you know, such kind of uh, settings. Uh, with this attachment, you know, all the uh, will create uh, all these, uh, you know, resources automatically. And here is a scaling policy. Actually, I want to give more uh, attention um, about the event property. Here, actually, you know, Selene policy uh, is some logical and rules will be enforced or executed before any action. Here, we use the event property to define what kind of, you know, uh, objective actions you want to guide use this policy. And uh, the type of adjustment, actually, here we use the change in capacity. With this definition, that means we will change the number of the nodes of, uh, of the target cluster when uh, once the alarm is triggered. And we similarly define a scale out policy. Here, we still use the change in capacity policies. Also, you can choose the percentage as another choice or a type of uh, uh, adjustment. That's our health policy here. Uh, there are three elements uh, are very important. The first one is uh, detection type. Here I will show the node status polling. That's the type that means we will use the health manager daemon to uh, polling all the nodes to show, uh, to, to know the failure happens and uh, do the recovery automatically. And uh, the interval means the, you know, the period uh, between the twice detection. And the recovery list actually we provide uh, different ways. That means when, uh, in what way we will do the recovery. We can uh, re recreate uh, the field nodes uh, or we just uh, rebuild or some other ways such as uh, uh, VMware fault tolerance things. And uh, uh, for the you know, receiver side, uh, here is an example how to define the receiver for the scale in. Actually, we use the receiver to encapsulate the action uh, when the external event or uh, you know, the alarm happens. Here, the action is used to define, uh, you know, the target action is a cluster scale in. And uh, the type is a web hook. That means how to you know trigger these things. Uh, and uh, uh, this will be in do, uh, invoked in the scale in alarm. Actually, uh, just as I mentioned, we will use the average rate of the load balancer incoming bytes instead of you know intra infrastructure level metrics here to uh, trigger the alarm of scale out and scale in. And here we have the threshold. The number uh, actually from you know come from the capacity analysis we do based on the you know target cluster. We use a seventy percentage of the you know peak value of throughput to do uh, to be work as the threshold. And then the you know the alarm actions here is uh, uh, corresponding to the receiver. Uh, I, I just you know defined. That's uh, the similar ways just uh, for the scale out. So we can show the demo very quickly. Oh. 
Okay. Let me do this way. Here, firstly, uh, you can see we will use Nova KPL add to create the SH KPL. Oh, it's too fast. Sorry. And uh, okay. And then we will use the template I just introduced uh, to create a heat stack. And after that, we can list uh, the stack. And uh, we can use uh, the Senlin uh, CRI commands actually to list uh, how many nodes, to see how many nodes created. Because we you know, define the minimum size of a cluster is two. So here we have two members, uh, two nodes. Actually, the two nodes uh, is uh, correspond to the two members of the load balancer. And then we will show the auto scaling scenario. Here, just uh, you know, the uh, recover some, you know, recall some policies I just mentioned here. Very quickly, we use the deletion policy. Here, actually, I want to give more, you know, highlights about the deletion policy. We use that to guide, you know. Uh, which, which candidate to choose when you scale in. That means here we use the criteria, like youngest first, that's uh, different with the uh, heat, you know, default implements. Because, you know, for the, in many customer case, actually, uh, you know, the longest one, you know, with the, the oldest one, actually, that's not the uh, best choice to delete because maybe it can run the uh, most stable and have some logs and important data layer. So here we choose the youngest first to delete. And then here is the uh, uh, receivers for scale out and scale in and uh, the corresponding alarms to trigger the, uh, the actions. Before that, we can show the list uh, again to see the status before the scale out. Then we will put some pricer layer. We use Shage to simulate the uh, transaction-based workload to the load balancers. Then after some while, we can, we can list again, you can see there's a new node is added to the uh, cluster and uh, accordingly it also be added to the load balancer pools as a new member. Then we can just uh, stop the uh, uh, stress and uh, for several cycles to see the auto scale in uh, scenario. Here you can see the youngest uh, has been deleted. We just, uh, you know, leave the first uh, two members in, uh, inside the pool untouched. Then we will show the auto scaling scenario. Uh, auto healing, sorry. <laughs> That's uh, uh, a quick, uh, quick recall about the health policy here. We used this polling and we use recreate. And then here, actually, uh, we list all the nodes again to see the, you know, the original status of the two active nodes. Then we will use Nova stop to simulate the failure of the two nodes. Then after uh, one cycle, actually, uh, suddenly has detected the failure of the nodes and uh, change uh, the node status into either. And then uh, suddenly will, uh, in the next cycle, will recover the failed nodes. That's need some time. Then in the third cycle, you can see the uh, suddenly node has been uh, re recovered into active again, but by recreate you know, the two, nodes, uh, two, uh, two new nodes, and the two new nodes will be added into the, you know, uh, load balancer pools to replace the failed members. So that's all what we want to show in the demonstration. 
uh, maybe now we can, you know, make some Q and A with our three. <laughs> There's a couple microphones here if you don't mind going to those. So, any questions? Um, Suggestions? Right. So, um, you talked about applying a clustering policy. So, if you apply a clustering policy to an existing set of containers and they're all on the same server, and your policy says to move them to another server, it'll move some of them to another physical uh, host, possibly? Uh, we don't yet support container clusters, uh, but it's on our agenda in this cycle. Uh, uh, for uh, yeah, for VMs, let's say. Uh, yeah, for VMs. Yeah, for sure. VMs, we can have several um, different options for you to specify. Uh, it's recovery options. You can do reboot, rebuild, um, evacuate, and finally recreate. OK. Yeah. And then um, you mentioned load balancing several times. Uh, what load balancer are you all using here? Uh, I'll, be, I'll be AAS v2. We use that interface, uh, but that can be configured in many ways, I think. Yeah, so basically it's the Neutron LBAS service. So okay. that has a pluggable layer underneath, and you can use whatever load balancer you want under that. Right, and so do you have a recommendation? <laughs> Come see me later. Okay. Here in the demo, I use uh, HA proxy. Uh, yeah, no, everybody keeps telling me HA proxy, and then uh, I look silly in front of other people talking about that instead of the F5. So anyhow, uh, Java applications. Um, so maybe some people in here know Java applications. Java containers are very unreliable. So um, are, are y'all looking at uh, you know? working with Java containers as uh, you know something you would manage and try to help run as a cluster? Uh, that's an interesting topic. We haven't yet looked into that. OK. But your thing, I think you mentioned you were looking at application uh, clustering. We got some requirements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Because I don't want to run WebLogic, and I need something for JBoss, right? So cool. Uh, OK, keep watching. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank everyone. you. Thank you, thank everyone. You.